Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, really happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for spending some time here this morning with me. Um, quick background before I jump into the company or into the presentation here and threat hunting. Uh, so I spent a good chunk of time inside the federal government prior to Squirrel, working cybersecurity issues at the Department of Homeland Security and then as director for cybersecurity strategy at the White House National Security Council staff. Uh, co-founded Squirrel with a group of guys out of the NSA, the R6 group, uh, the research and development group, and uh, we've built out a threat hunting platform. But really, this is uh, much less about our tool and more about threat hunting strategy, methodology, and approaches. So um, maybe just to get a feel for the audience, anyone here already consider themselves a threat hunter? All right, one, two, three, four. Um, any CPT members? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll make this as interactive as you all like it to be, so feel free to jump in as I'm going through any of these slides with questions. Uh, don't worry about interrupting my flow. I'll go pretty quickly through slides until we hit something that's interesting, and then we can pause and, and dig into it uh, more deeply. Uh, but first, let's dig into what exactly threat hunting is. Uh, but first, before that, why should people hunt? And, you know, this is a statistic from a survey that was done this past year of, of 300,000 security professionals. And the, one of the top reasons people are hunting today is simply because traditional tools aren't working all that well. Advanced persistent adversaries will punch through perimeter defenses. Uh, organizational boundaries are dissolving with BYOD and cloud computing. There are many ways into an organization and threat hunting is that process to look inside your organization, look for those threats that have punched their way in. <clears throat> so a little bit more on that definition. Um, I think about threat hunting sort of as the flip side of penetration testing. Penetration testing is the proactive search for vulnerabilities that you may have missed inside your organization. Threat hunting is the proactive search for adversaries that may have been missed by your existing defenses, your SIM, your perimeter tools, et cetera. Um, so it's essentially looking in your blind spots. Uh, and you know, it's funny, I've seen some vendors out there starting talking about how their solution fully automates the hunt. Uh, from our perspective, that's impossible. Uh, if, if you're not hunting if you're fully automated things. That's a firewall, that's an IDS. Hunting, from our perspective, is always gonna be human driven. Now, certainly you can use analytics, you can use tools to help simplify hunting, but you're never gonna take the human out of the loop. Um, and it's a continuous process. Uh, hunting never ends. Uh, it's a continuous loop, and we'll get into that in a bit in terms of hunting methodology. And uh, you know, I think one of the reasons you've seen this explosion hunting over the last 12 to 18 months is really the fact that there's lots of new types of analytic techniques that make hunting even more powerful, so going beyond basic signatures and rules and using more advanced analytics and data science. So the rise of hunting. Uh, any Air Force folks here? No? Uh, so we traced uh, the, the origin of the term threat hunting to an Air Force presentation in 2007. So threat hunting's been around inside DOD for the last 10 years or so. But it's really over the last 12 to 18 months where the interest in threat hunting has exploded, both within government and in industry. Uh, this blue line here is actually the Google Trends searches for threat hunting. And you can see here about uh, 12 to 18 months ago, you know, things really start getting interesting. But 
Uh, like I said, it's been around for about 10 years. Uh, Richard Baitlick, one of our advisors, uh, former uh, CSO at Mandiant, he really talked about threat hunting in great detail in his 2013 book. We've been talking about it for several years. Uh, and it's been fun watching the rise of threat hunting within the vendor community. Uh, probably two years ago at the RSA conference, uh, we are maybe one of three or four vendors talking about threat hunting. If folks were at Black Hat a couple weeks ago out in Vegas, uh, it was probably the hottest buzzword on the floor. It seemed like every other vendor was now talking about threat hunting. So the interest has really peaked in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Uh, one of the organizations that's been doing some amazing stuff around threat hunting is the SANS Institute. Um, they have some new threat hunting curriculum that we've helped develop. Uh, but they've also been doing threat hunting surveys of their practitioners over the last two years. They've also done a threat hunting summit over the last two years down in New Orleans. If you're interested in threat hunting, highly, highly recommend attending this, this uh, conference. It's small, close-knit, and all of the top threat hunters from across the community attend. So it's a really great gathering. But uh, th these surveys that they do uh, are really interesting. Uh, I'll summarize what I think my key findings are. One, the people that are doing threat hunting are finding significant improvements in their security posture. Um, but we still have a ways to go. Threat hunting is still a relatively immature practice. There's not a lot of doctrine or training around threat hunting. And there's still a ways to go to move it from an ad hoc practice into something that's institutionalized inside SOX and, and security organizations. Now, one of the things that uh, we've developed at Squirrel to help try to get everyone a bit on the same page about what exactly threat hunting is, is this threat hunting maturity model. Now, this is in the same vein as a, a software development maturity model. Um, but each of these levels means something. Level zero means that you're not really hunting. Usually you're just doing your normal alert triage processes. So you're in a fully reactive mode. You're reacting to the waves and onslaughts of alerts coming off your SIM and other tools, and that's you know, probably sucking up pretty much all of your time inside your SOC. Uh, level one uh, typically correlates to the fact that you have some threat intelligence capability in place. So you have analysts that are reading threat intelligence reports. Uh, they're developing hunting hypotheses based on that. And they're going into their SIM or other tools to do some proactive searches based on that knowledge that they've gained from those threat intelligence reports. Uh, level two means you're going beyond just threat intelligence. You're doing some procedural, you're really following other people's recipes, hunting recipes. And I'll go through some different sources for threat hunting recipes in a few slides here. But you know, going beyond just threat intelligence and doing other types of hunts, doing more anomaly-driven hunts, family uh, crown jewel asset analysis. I'll show you some of the examples of that. Uh, level three, you're actually not just following other people's hunting recipes, but developing your own. And level four is really about tr trying to automate as much of the process as you can. Like I said, you're never going to fully automate threat hunting, but um, we don't expect that every organization is going to have their own data science team that is developing machine learning algorithms. So uh, using uh, threat hunting platforms to help automate some of that work so you're not spending all your time just doing analytic development, uh, but also plugging threat hunting results into the rest of your organization. So once you've conducted a successful hunt and you've found new suspicious indicators of compromise or compromised hosts, you know, being able to take automated remediation actions through security orchestration tools and platforms. So it's really, you know, plugging that hunting process into all the other organizational or security processes inside your SOC and trying to automate those coordination points as much as possible. All right, so this is what we call our threat hunting loop. This is, uh, I see this reference all over the place now. Uh, but this is really a top-level threat hunting methodology. Um, and hunts always start with hypotheses. And we think about hypotheses in several different buckets. You can have hypotheses driven by threat intelligence. You can have hypotheses driven by lists of high-value assets and conducting hunts around them. 
uh, inside DOD that's oftentimes referred to as identifying key cyber terrain and conducting hunts around them. And uh, you can also uh, conduct hunts based on or develop hypotheses based on what we call friendly intelligence, um, uh, which is understanding your network, understanding your crown jewel assets. Uh, and then the third one actually is uh, conducting hunts around kill chain frameworks. So looking for specific types of anomalies inside your organization that are aligned to the kill chain framework. And I'll show you some examples of that too. But once you have your hypotheses defined, it's all about investigating and trying to prove or disprove those hunting hypotheses. Uh, and the goal of a hunt is actually twofold. And this is a little bit of a nuanced point in that you know, most people, when they think about hunting, think about it as really just trying to find evil, trying to find the bad guys in your network. But the real goal of hunting is twofold, not only to find evil, but find new ways of automating the detection of evil. So as you're going through a hunt, you should also be thinking about how do I take this new pattern that I found and create a new analytic around it so that I can automate the search for that pattern moving forward. And it's this closed loop process that's uh, you know, really essential to hunting. And you know, typically, as you're going through a hunt, you are you know, either proving or disproving your hypothesis, and a bunch of sub-hypotheses are popping out that you then need to push through this process. All right. So let's talk a little about building a hunt team. Uh, so the f there's sort of like two views, two perspectives to this. Uh, the first one is, you know, how much time should analysts be spending on hunting? And uh, we see a couple of different models across our customer base. Uh, some of our very largest customers, they have dedicated hunt teams. Uh, and usually these are the, the, the security ninjas, the tier three analysts, and pretty much all they do is hunt. Um, in most places that we, that we go to though, hunting is a collateral duty. So people are spending X percentage of their time doing hunting, usually the level two, level three analysts, um, but you know, so they're spending maybe 60, 70% of their time doing alert triage work, uh, doing incident investigation type work, and then that other 20, 30, 40% of their time they're spending on proactive hunting of threats. Uh, from our perspective, uh, a blended model is actually really useful. And, and this is actually, I think, what we're starting to see with some of the, the cyber protection teams in that you know, they're going in there, a person does a rotation through the cyber protection team. Um, in, during that rotation, they're really focused primarily on hunting, also some incident investigations, but you know, a lot of hunting focus. And then they might rotate back into uh, a more permanent SOC deployment, take those hunting skills that they've gained, and fold that back into their security operations center. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's, that's a typical setup that we see. And that may not be what Target's doing, but I would guess it is because Target, uh, they have a lot of former GE SOC people there that were really some of the founders around hunting theory and methodology. Yeah, Tim Crothers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, usually those level one, level two analysts, level one analysts are doing sort of simple alert triage. Uh, they're deciding whether alerts should be dismissed and escalated to level two analysts. Um, if you are a big enough SOC to have level three analysts, you know, they're doing sort of the, the higher end analysis, doing sort of like the full root cause analysis on an incident. Uh, but you know, from our perspective and uh, what we're working with a number of customers on is dual hatting those analysts to you know, take on hunting missions. So they're not just focused on wave after wave of alert from their SIM they're carving out time to do proactive hunting also. 
Now, the other sort of dimension to this, and this is really probably most applicable to cyber protection team members and the cyber protection brigade as a whole, is do, you, do hunting in a deployable model or as in a more permanent situation? So the cyber protection teams, um, you know, their primary uh, uh, SOP is actually deploying out to, to uh, four deployed bases, garrisons, uh, to you know, areas around the world to essentially be the cyber SWAT team. They drop in, uh, they typically bring a big kit with them that's ruggedized servers with their tooling on, and they'll do a, a hunt maybe for two, three, four weeks. Um, and you know, oftentimes they're doing that because that organization, uh, that, uh, that units where they're doing that hunting in, maybe they don't have good security coverage. Maybe they don't have good security analysts, maybe they don't have good security tools. Um, maybe there's a new mission that's gonna be, take place within that network, a new operational mission associated with that network, and they wanna go in there and make sure that that network is clean and free of any, of any bad guys. So uh, obviously there's value there, but frankly this is like the hardest type of hunting because you're dropping into a new network that you don't know anything about and you're tr quickly trying to understand you know, what's the baseline of normal patterns of behavior, you know, what looks out of place. It's a, it's a tough job. Um, frankly, uh, whenever possible, the more permanent deployed hunting teams are gonna likely be more effective. Um, so if you're permanently deployed inside of a security operations center, you get to know your network much, much better. You understand where the crown jewel assets are, you understand your, your cyber terrain, you understand patterns of normal and abnormal. Um, so, um, you know, permanents, permanents are usually more effective, but, um, you know, sometimes the mobile is just required. So, uh, if you can do both, that's great. If, if you have to do both, you know, that's, uh, that's sometimes just what you have to do. All right, so in terms of the skill sets needed uh, as sort of the, the perfect hunter, uh, it's really a broad set of skill sets. Um, so the perfect hunter is part data scientist, part threat intelligence expert, part network expert, and part endpoint expert. Now, there's not many few, not too many of these types of people. You know, it's, those types of people are, are unicorns. Um, so in reality, you know, people are usually experts in one or two of these areas. Um, and uh, from a hunt team perspective, you typically want to build a hunt team that has a mix of these skill sets. Uh, as example, the Department of Homeland Security's hunting incident response team, they actually have a network team and an endpoint team. And those are different specialties, different skill sets, and those folks then come together and collaborate uh, on a, an actual hunt. All right, this is an actual job post, which we thought was really, really cool. Uh, so this is a, a job post for, for a hunt team analyst. And uh, from our perspective, this company really gets it. Um, so, you know, this is all sort of the standard stuff that you'd be doing as a hunter. This is the stuff that, you know, we think is the more nuanced parts of a, the job of a hunter, but is absolutely critical. So to be a hunter, you need to be a continuous learner. And not only a continuous learner, but you need to be willing to share that information and mentor people. So, um, you know, that's really the key for hunting is, is collaborating and sharing knowledge across a team and learning from each other. And that continuous learning uh, approach uh, is something that we certainly encourage. Now, something I referenced a little bit uh, at the beginning of the talk, but from our perspective, something that you know, really signals that we're still at a relatively immature state with hunting is that there isn't much out there in terms of hunting doctrine, hunting training, um, and uh, we've certainly been trying to push the envelope on that a little bit. Um, so some of the stuff that we've just been doing internally with, within Squirrel is building out hunting playbooks. So for every major kill chain tactic, we build out a playbook about what are the different types of questions that analysts should be asking, what are the types of analytics that they should be running, 
to look for that type of kill chain tactic or TTP within their organization. Um, so that's sort of internal squirrel stuff, but we've also been sponsoring and working on an open source project called threathunting.net, the threat hunting project. And this is a really cool site, highly recommend any hunters out there, if you're not familiar with this, go check it out. Uh, but this is a GitHub repository of threat hunting recipes collected from some of the top hunters uh, really around, around the country, both uh, primarily commercial. I don't know if there's been too many government submissions at this point, but I know some of the CPT folks have, have been in here and using some of this stuff. All right. So let's uh, sort of dive into this a little bit more and start talking about um, some more hunting frameworks and how to actually go about doing a hunt. So I, I mentioned different types of hunting hypotheses. Uh, these are those three different hypotheses that we typically use within our hunting efforts. Uh, but we have these kill chain driven hypotheses. So really looking across the kill chain, understanding where your gaps are in terms of your detection capabilities and then hunting in those gaps. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, threat intel driven. For me, this is less about sort of like simple indicators of compromise that you can subscribe to from open source feeds, government feeds, or commercial feeds. And this is really more about sort of that more polished threat intelligence, the threat intelligence reports that are put out by folks like Mandiant and CrowdStrike, and uh, really understanding what are the types of threat actors that are targeting your industry or your government organization, what are the TTPs of those threat actors, and then conducting specific hunts around them. And then lastly, uh, the friendly intel driven hunt. I, I think um, you know, another way to think about this is understanding your key cyber terrain. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting after the OPM breach was that uh, uh, the National Security Council uh, directed all government agencies to, under, to identify their key cyber terrain, their uh, crown jewel assets. Uh, the White House really wanted to make sure that moving forward, uh, we understood where all of our important databases of information were and that they received appropriate risk-based protection. So every department agency now in the federal government has a list of their crown jewel assets um, and should be conducting regular hunts around them to look for any anomalies or strange things happening around them. But let me sort of jump into that first type of uh, hunt a little bit more detail. Um, so uh, we love the MITRE attack matrix. Any MITRE folks here? No? Yeah? All right. Uh, so yeah, we love the MITRE attack matrix. The MITRE attack matrix uh, sort of looks at the kill chain and really focuses on the right side of the kill chain and then dives into awesome detail about what are the very specific TTPs that align to those uh, command and control, action on objective type kill chain steps. Um, so there's, uh, this is all open online on the MITRE attack matrix site. Uh, and you know, this provides the framework, this can provide the framework for how you want to structure those kill chain oriented or anomaly driven hunts. You know, essentially, these are different types of anomalies that you might want to structure hunts around. So um, action objectives is where all the really interesting stuff typically happens. Um, and you know, these are just some of the different types of uh, uh, action objectives uh, related tactics. Uh, and like I said, these all become potential hunting starting points. Now, once you have picked your your framework here, such as the kill chain or a uh, MITRE attack matrix, the goal from there is to really do a gap analysis. So this eye chart here is really a full breakdown of the MITRE attack matrix. So these are, at the top here, you know, people say tactics, techniques, and procedures a lot, TTPs. Sometimes I think that's almost a buzzword in itself. The MITRE attack matrix actually defines very specific TTPs. The tactics are the things that are on the top. These are all techniques. And then within them are specific procedures. So each cell you can imagine containing a, a, a TTP or more. Now, as part of this gap analysis, the goal is to look at your organization, 
and understand across all of these TTPs, what am I already detecting quite well? Like, what does my SIM detect well? What, is my, what do my firewalls detect well? And, uh, and then you'll understand what are the TTPs that are appropriate to my organization and that I don't have good automated detection coverage around. Those TTP, TTPs are the ones that you likely want to prioritize your hunts around. So uh, there's actually some really cool online tools that uh, help do this prioritization process put together by someone named Roberto Rodriguez from Capital One. Uh, highly recommend folks download, download that to, to make this gap analysis as easy as possible. All right. The other dimension to this is you know, really building out your hunt calendar. Um, and our recommendation is always start from the right and move back. Um, the right hand side, you know, this is the, these are the types of TTPs that leave the most prevalent uh, signs of behavior behind. And also, these are the ones that have the greatest consequence. You know, as you start moving towards you know, actual data exfiltration or other types of right hand side kill chain activities, those are the things that you want to make sure that you have very good coverage on. And if you don't have good automated coverage, those are things that you want to, uh, to conduct hunts around. And then as you move further left, you know, in, my, in our opinion, these are things that you can do less frequently. So if you're building out a schedule, you know, maybe you're doing these things every week, maybe you're doing these things you know, uh, once or twice a month, and these are things that are maybe done you know, semi-annually. So building out that hunting calendar is, uh, is critical to, uh, to aligning your priorities. <clears throat> All right, so I've been talking a lot about hunting. Uh, hunting probably sounds a little bit like a manual process, and that's mainly because historically it's been a very manual, very labor-intensive process. Um, there's a new generation of tools called threat hunting platforms that are really designed to simplify, streamline, and speed up hunts. Um, so, you know, why do you need a hunting platform? You know, these first two boxes here, I mean, that's really why you should be hunting in general, uh, because you believe there are attackers that have penetrated your perimeter or other defenses and are inside your network. Uh, you've moved to that mindset of not if I'm going to be uh, uh, compromised, but uh, when was I compromised? Uh, and also hunting, um, and we've actually done some really interesting work with uh, SOCOM and other DOD agencies on this. Hunting it can actually help you reduce your attack surface. So as you're doing these hunting processes, you're finding new vulnerabilities that you can help proactively also close. But this one, this one is perhaps the most important. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the DOD CPTs that we've been working with, uh, they had a 30-person CPT team. Uh, they were using a sim uh, to try to hunt. And they essentially had one analyst, a chief warrant officer, that was experienced enough of an analyst, that was sophisticated enough with that sim to actually conduct hunts. The other 29 analysts were really struggling. Um, and so uh, by using a threat hunting platform, you can really help democratize hunting so that's more approachable by even the, the more junior analysts. There's also another, you know, going back to that earlier slide around um, that SAN survey and, uh, you know, sort of the good things and bad things going on with hunting. One of the other, I think, nuanced points in that survey that's really important is that they found that organizations that were doing hunting had a much higher retention rate of their employees. Now, you could argue whether correlation versus causation there, but from my perspective, that's mainly driven by the fact that hunting you know, is, this, is this process where analysts and employees are continuously expanding their skill sets. They're not just you know, doing this drab thing where they're just working a list of alerts. And hunting can actually has this virtuous cycle going on with it where not only are you finding bad things, but you're building a stronger, stronger human capital, you're building a stronger security organization, you're building a security organization that employees want to be at. 
Uh, now, Threat Engine Platform is relatively new. Gartner did their, this is a, a quick, quick squirrel promotion, but uh, Gartner did a, uh, their first Threat Engine report. They identified you know, what types of tools are being used for threat hunting. Most people that we talk to are using SIMS to, to do their hunting today. They're using their Splunk, their ArcSight instance to conduct hunts. Um, and you, know, you can certainly hunt in a SIM. It's just, it is a very labor intensive manual process. Um, you know, from our perspective and, and also Gartner's perspective, the key to hunting uh, in a hunting platform is really doing two, th uh, I'd say three things well. One, being able to ingest, easily ingest diverse data sets. You know, so think about that CPT member that drops into a new network, only has three weeks there. They can't spend those three weeks trying to munge data to get it into a, into a tool. They need the ability to get that data in rapidly and start hunting uh, day one. Uh, secondly, uh, hunting platforms should utilize advanced analytics. Um, so uh, machine learning analytics, both supervised and unsupervised, uh, graph algorithms, you know, basically go beyond those simple rule-based and signature-based analytics and look for unusual behaviors. So instead of just you know, doing matching against IOCs, indicators of compromise, looking for unusual behaviors in, in the data uh, that really can be uh, done through machine learning. And then lastly, and this is a really important point, I think, uh, go beyond just simple log-based searching of the data. Uh, anyone uh, familiar with uh, Analyst Notebook, Palantir? Yeah, so uh, those link analysis type tools, uh, from our perspective, are really geared towards hunting. Now, those aren't really cybersecurity tools, those are more like multi-intelligence fusion tools, but those same concepts using link analysis to go beyond just simple log-based searching of the data and allow analysts to much more easily pivot through their data uh, without having to write lots of complicated search scripts or queries. All right, now let's, uh, let's show you some, some example hunts here. Uh, I, I like, this, art. I like this, uh, this cartoon. I don't know if folks follow XKCD. Uh, but you know, sometimes people think algorithms are magic. They're not. <laughs> They are hard to build, uh, and they're hard to build in a way that um, can keep false positives to a minimum and that can produce results that are actually useful. I mean, I've seen this hands-on with uh, you know, things like the DISA big data platform uh, where it's taken them years to build relatively simple analytics. Um, so, Algorithms aren't magic, but when you can get them right, they can be quite powerful. You know, I, this, uh, this is sort of a, the process that we use at Squirrel to build a hunting analytic. And you know, I, I had that slide up there earlier about uh, the skill sets needed for the perfect hunter. Uh, what we found, at least in our own hiring, is that it's almost impossible to find someone with that combination of skill sets uh, so what we do uh, is we actually put teams of people together to build these advanced analytics. Uh, it takes a village to hunt, I guess. Um, so you know, we have uh, threat hunters, basically advanced security analysts, that are defining the types of kill chain behaviors, oftentimes using that MITRE attack matrix to frame things, but defining the types of behaviors or TTPs that uh, we want to build analytics for. Uh, then we give those behaviors to data scientists. So, you know, PhD data scientists that can do cool stuff with multivariate Bayesian statistics and classifiers and k-means algorithms, et cetera, things I don't fully understand, uh, but essentially translate those, those TTPs and behaviors into specific types of algorithms that can look for those behaviors. Then those data scientists work with our computer scientists that are, have experience in building big distributed systems using technologies like Hadoop and Apache Spark, taking those algorithms, pushing them into distributed systems and deploying them at scale. And then lastly, there's a feedback loop here. So you know, as a security analyst, so, you know, end user of the tool is actually going in and doing hunts, 
they need the ability to classify things like, okay, was this analytic result a true positive, a false positive, should it be whitelisted? Those true positive and false, false positive labels need to be fed back into the algorithms so that the algorithms are continuously learning, not only just from the data that's coming in, but also from the analyst feedback. So it takes, it takes a village. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, one hunt in particular, uh, which I think is a pretty interesting one. I'm going to talk about lateral movement, hunting for lateral movement. Um, one, of our, one of our folks actually did an amazing webinar on this uh, last month. If folks are interested in, in getting even more details on this and hearing from our CTO about the details of some of our algorithms, highly recommend to check out that webinar. Uh, but I'll talk about it uh, briefly here. So. Uh, Bottom line, there's lots of ways to do louder movement. Uh, you know, pass the hash techniques, RDP techniques, uh, but louder movement, generally speaking, is the process during which an adversary who has gained an initial beachhead starts hopping from machine to machine with the goal of escalating privileges on the network, with the goal of uh, finding information that might they might want to exfiltrate. Um, but the, the general behavior is hopping from machine to machine, from host to host. Now, there are a number of ways to detect lateral movement, and it's really a spectrum. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side of the spectrum are very specialized techniques looking for those very specialized different types of lateral movement. So you can dive deep into Windows event logs, look at certain event types, and build like a very specific analytic around a very specific lateral movement technique based on that specific log event type. Um, now those types of analytics can be quite effective in that you know, they oftentimes will have a relatively low false positive rate, but they're fairly brittle in that uh, any sort of small change in TTP can break that analytic. Essentially it's easy for adversaries to evade that analytic with any change in TTP. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, which is, you know, and by the way, this type of, of detection, this is very good for SIMS. So, you know, this is more of a signature-based detection uh, that really SIMS specialize in. Now, from a hunting perspective, and, and what we try to do is instead uh, look, instead of looking at the very specific TTP, look for the behavior at the higher level tactic. So, uh, with lateral movement, uh, we're looking really for this higher level behavior, which is around chained or linked suspicious login events. So a grouping or a chain of login events that just look a little bit odd. So uh, a credential is used on a machine that's not typically used on. A credential is used at a time of day or day of the week that's not typically used on. Uh, looking for those odd login behaviors, but looking for correlations across them. Uh, because, you know, that's really what an, an adversary is doing. They're hopping from machine to machine, looking for passwords, looking for information. Now, I'll dive into this at a really high level. Whoop. So, you know, there's a number of, we call them risk factors, that go into uh, our lateral movement detection. Uh, at a high level, what we're doing is we're actually, we are taking Windows event logs in, uh, you know, failed and successful login events, and we're passing them through an unsupervised machine learning algorithm to look for rare login events. So we'll usually train that algorithm uh, for a week or so to set some initial baseline about what a normal login event looks like and what a rare login event looks like. And then we start identifying rare login events that deviate from that baseline. Then we use uh, a multi-hop graph algorithm that's looking for temporal correlations across those rare login events and chain them together into predicted lateral movement pathways. So you can see some of those, um, some of those uh, risk factors portrayed here. Uh, so we call this our, our caterpillar chart. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're looking for logins that um, you know, have sort of the right amount of time between them so if you have two rare login events, but they're like space a year apart, that's unlikely to be part of a louder movement event. That's probably just two random rare login events. You know, 
Uh, lateral movement is executed by adversaries, so it's usually done in the form of you know, minutes or hours as they're moving across an organization you know, during a normal workday. Uh, but we're also looking for things like uh, the overall time frame, which is also related to what I was just talking about. We're looking for those rare login events in particular. Um, we're looking for, you know, we're also looking for failed login events. So if uh, we want to see, or we want to see clusters of those failed login events. So as an adversary jumps to a new node, he may be trying to pivot to a bunch of other endpoints. It's not likely that they're going to get into all those endpoints. So you're going to see sort of this fanning a type of uh, graphic in our, in, our, in our tool in terms of those failed login events. So some pretty heavy duty sophisticated math under the covers there. You know, obviously not every organization has the, the internal data scientists to build out these types of algorithms that are really useful for hunting, which is where those uh, threat hunting platforms come into play. So uh, let's see here. I'm going to walk through a hunt here quickly, um, uh, actually using our tool just to give you a sense of what a hunt actually looks like, give you a sort of a more concrete feel for what people are doing during a hunt. So uh, this is our this is our homepage. Uh, this is uh, you know basically creating a number of different types of starting points for hunters. Um, at the top there is just some summary information on uh, you know, kill chain risk scores and other types of detections that we've done inside of our platform. Uh, but really the goal here is to use these different columns here as different hunting starting points. And so we have high risk detections oriented around the kill chain, so those kill chain driven hunts. And we also have high risk entities, uh, sort of that, that more key cyber terrain or crown jewel oriented type hunts. And uh, you know, typical workday for an analyst using uh, our tool as a hunting platform is that they're logging in and they're working down these lists of high-risk entities and high-risk detections, but using them as hunting starting points. It's a different, different mindset than just sort of doing alert triage. The goal here is not to triage these things. The goal is to use them as hunting starting points and really look for other types of uh, suspicious activity that might be connected to them you know, two, three, four, five hops away. So click on those uh, detections. Uh, let's look at lateral movement. Uh, click into that. And this is uh, our lateral movement detector, sort of that caterpillar graphic that I showed you, but, you know, displayed uh, in, within our platform. Uh, basically what you're seeing here is that that algorithm or algorithms, it's really a suite of algorithms, predicted that there was a lateral movement event starting at machine 706 and ending at machine 586. These credentials were used to hop from machine to machine. The green arrows represent failed log, I'm sorry, represent successful login events. The red arrow represents a failed login event. These are all relatively rare login events. So that unsupervised machine learning algorithm flag them all as relatively rare login events. Uh, the red arrow, you, basically the adversary may have hit a little bit of a dead end there. That's one of those failed login events, and it, but then continue down the path here. Um, uh, you can, you can, uh, there's an ability to label these as true positive and false positive. Those labels are also fed back into the system. But the real goal here is to use this, we call it a hunting trailhead. Use this as a jumping off point into the hunt. It's really also the difference between just like having an analytic and having a hunting platform. The analytic is not the end goal. The analytic is the starting point for the hunt. So what we do from here is take that analytic result. And by the way, this could be also a piece of threat intelligence. If we're doing sort of that threat intel driven hunt, it could just be an entity that's been flagged as a uh, high value asset. But in either way, in all three of those ways, we're moving that analytic result into the graph canvas here, and we're going to start pivoting. So in our opinion, the key to hunting is asking questions of the data, interrogating the data, and pivoting through the data seamlessly. And um, we can do that quite easily using these link analysis type capabilities. You can see what I'm going to be doing here is not writing any queries or search scripts, but using the link analysis capabilities to search the data. So 
Uh, first thing, let's uh, select all those hosts. And uh, let's expand to see what all the network resolutions are for those hosts. Um, so that brings back all of the IP addresses that are associated with all those hosts. Now you can see that some of these hosts, like 706, actually have several IP addresses with them. Um, so you, know, we have the, you have the ability to dig into that, you know, better understand why that is. Uh, in some cases, this can be like a, a real issue because it could mean that uh, you know, there's multiple network adapters on that host. You know, sometimes adversaries will use the fact that there's multiple IP addresses on this host to like, do things like bypassing firewalls. Because if that host has access to two se separate subnets represented by two separate IP addresses, one way of getting around a firewall is through that host that has direct access to both of those subnets. So these, uh, when you see multiple IP addresses like that, it could mean a lot of things, but you know, it's always worth investigating. But from here, what we want to do is look to see, uh, do we have any other suspicious events hanging off any of these IP addresses? So we're now sort of going another hop removed to see is there anything else going on that might be one hop removed from that initial loud movement detection. And it brought back a number of things. Uh, so as an analyst at this point, I'd be really, uh, really nervous. But you can see it brought back a number of beaconing events. This is another analytic that we do. It's really looking at um, network traffic and looking for pulse-like behavior in network traffic that is really a, how a piece of malware communicates with a command and control server. Usually, they're phoning home to let that command and control server know that, they're that that piece of malware is alive and well, and doing that with regular pings of traffic uh, to that, that command and control server. Uh, we have a number of DNS tunnels that came back. And so DNS tunneling is the technique where uh, an adversary encrypts data that they may want to ex exfiltrate out of the network and hides that encrypted data in subdomains of, D, of DNS queries. And then uh, they're using a compromised DNS server somewhere to exfiltrate, to retrieve that encrypted data embedded in the subdomains of the DNS queries and then piecing it back together. Um, so it's a pretty sophisticated way of, of exfilling data because DNS channels are oftentimes not very monitored very well. Um, but um, we, and we found some really bad malware that completely slipped past the, uh, all endpoint defenses at government agencies, but were tunneling out uh, data. Um, so we have some, some very scary real world instances where this tunneling has happened. Uh, but anyways, we have a bunch of new detections and alerts that are on the board now, one hop removed from that louder movement detection. By the way, really quick on that DNS tunneling thing, that's also an unsupervised machine learning analytic. Uh, basically, the way that it works under the covers is that we're taking DNS query logs, passing them through an unsupervised machine learning algorithm to build out a baseline of what normal subdomains look like for that organization. And then we're looking for subdomains that have high entropy or randomness associated with them. And that high entropy or randomness is correlated to encrypted data. Um, but anyways, uh, we have a bunch of detections and alerts on the board now. So let's do another expansion. You know, once again, no queries needed to see where all those are resolving to. So the thing that jumps out uh, immediately on here is this node right here, this 118 node, which is a, an external uh, an external IP address, and you can see that all three of those beaconing events are resolving to it. So that immediately becomes a very strong candidate to be a command and control server. Now, uh, one way to try to verify that hypothesis that that's a command and control server is to check to see if you have any um, uh, threat intelligence associated with that IP address or with the domain that it resolves to. And so we pulled in some, some threat intelligence here. If you click in, there's just a single hit, which you can see down here. And so if you click into that, you can get the details on that threat intel hit. So 
this, this hunt is far from over, but you can see that you're starting to build an attack narrative. And that's really the goal for hunting and, and putting it in a visual way that you know, an analyst could report up to you know, a, a CO uh, about what actually was this hunt. You can actually also record and replay this hunt if you want. But you can see that initial lateral movement hit and really the goal of hunting is that pivoting process to try to see what else, it's, what else is connected to it and ultimately as you continue to build this out, you might eventually get to the full root cause of the incident. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, we're typically getting most of our data from the sim, except in the deployable kit scenario. So the deployable kit scenario, I mean, integration with the sim, you know, we can usually do that start to finish within a few weeks. That timeline doesn't work for a deployable kit. So we have our own network and endpoint sensors that you can drop into a network as part of that deployable kit. Yep. All right. Uh, Last slide, so how to learn more. Uh, we got a bunch of really great resources on our website, webinars, white papers, ebooks, et cetera. Uh, threat Hunting Project, that's um, um, the GitHub site full of threat hunting recipes collected from some of the top experts around the world. And we also have been uh, sponsoring uh, threathuntingacademy.com, which is a collection of sort of little mini e-courses and lectures by some of the top threat hunters out there. Eric Cole is one of the lead SANS instructors. Chris Sanders, uh, lead threat hunter, he just left FireEye. David Bianco, uh, one of our lead threat hunters. Uh, so uh, lots of great, uh, great resources there on that Threat Hunting Academy site. So with that, uh, I'll uh, open up to questions if anyone has any. I assume so. Yeah, we will, yeah. Yes. Oh, excellent. I didn't know that. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big trends that I'm seeing in general across the security industry is, is around automation. And um, a lot of sort of like the basic alert triaging process that sucks up so much time inside of a SOC is actually now starting to be automated through security orchestration and automation tools, through machine learning uh, oriented tools. And that's great in my perspective because that can hopefully free up analyst time to do these higher end and, in my opinion, higher value activities uh, like threat hunting. But yeah, there's, I mean, in the, some of the other things that are going on uh, inside the government, uh, GSA stood up some new, uh, uh, they call them SINs, special item numbers around threat hunting services to make it easier for agencies to purchase threat hunting services. Um, so there's, uh, you know, hunt teams being stood up across, you know, every DOD agency through the cyber protection team. So certainly a lot of activity. Any other questions? Any questions? Oh. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the time. Thanks. <laughs> in lieu of that, AFSCME actually makes a contribution to Fisher. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Remember, uh, Dan uh, will hopefully keep the press.
Hi there. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, your slides are much better than mine, though. <laughs> yeah, I've, um, you're with the CPB? Well, we met here, but I work for the past. Okay, great, yeah. So, we've been uh, supposed to be with Colonel Sanson next week. And uh, we were in the nerd with, uh, nerd? Yeah, with Major Trevino, who just uh, spun out of there. So, hopefully, I just did a quote actually to outfit all the CBPs with our all the CPTs with our tool. So hopefully that that uh, happens sometimes. I should probably take off this mic. <laughs> <laughs>
and it's hot.